Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 323 of Stand Up. Joining me today is writer, author, and professor Jared Yates Sexton. I'm your pal Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up with me right now. Stand up. Hello, and welcome to Stand Up Daily. This will be an abbreviated version of Stand Up. Normally, I open with a 20 to 30 minute news section that covers everything you can think of from the 24 hours just before, but because it was Easter Sunday and because we took advantage of the holiday, which we don't celebrate, but, you know, to do something with the girls who had the, the whole week off and tomorrow and Tuesday for some reason from school, Val decided we were going to go for the roller coasters and we headed out to Hershey Park, all vaccinated, all masked up, feeling like it was worth taking a risk. And boy, did we need it. Family hadn't been away, like I'm sure many of yours, for over a year. We got a hotel for the night, and we had a great time. We really did. But we got back late. I'm absolutely exhausted, and there's just no way I can put it all together for you at the top of tonight's show. You know what? Susie Havman did email me, longtime listener and subscriber, and said, You know, Pete, just take a few days off. Maybe I'm just too smitten with you, or maybe it's... After 11 years of listening to you, it creates a loyalty that won't wither away because of a few days up. But it's healthy to break up the routine and keep the mind guessing about what's coming next. Besides, we could use a break, too. I feel pressure trying to find time to listen to your daily, albeit fantastic, podcasts every day. There's just not enough hours with kindness and understanding for whatever you decide. So I took a couple random days off last week, catch up and do things and I, I'm, uh, I'm taking a, a partial day because I'm just sharing one interview and no news today. Please forgive me. I'll get right back to the regularly formatted schedule tomorrow. But I'm very happy to share this conversation I had with Jared Yates Sexton. He's always one of your favorite guests on the show. He's a really smart guy who is an author, a political commentator, and associate professor at the Department of Writing and Linguistics at Georgia, Georgia Southern University. His most recent book is American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. He also wrote a great book called The Man They Wanted Me to Be, Toxic Masculinity, and A Crisis of Our Own Making. You can follow him on Twitter at JY Sexton. You can listen to his podcast, The Muckrake Podcast, which is very good. And support him now on Substack, which is his newsletter, which he is now publishing. Very busy guy. And that's called Dispatches from a Collapsing State. I'll link a subscription link in the show notes. And before I say anything more in this delirious, exhausted, and slightly nauseous after all those roller coasters state, here now is my conversation with Jared Yates Sexton. I hope you enjoy it. We'll get back to the regular format tomorrow. Yeah, very excited to talk with my friend Jared Yates Sexton. There he is. Hi, how are you? I'm good, but you look glowing from the vaccine. It looks like it's done wonders for you, Pete. Yeah, well, you know, there's not a lot to improve upon. You can't get a lot better than this. Yeah, but it's like like a filter. It turns you up by about two degrees. Sure. There's just something vital about you right now. Like I said, there's really only two degrees up to go from from where I was at pre vaccine but it feels amazing i am so happy about it you two got the same one i did the moderna juice and uh but you said it it really knocked you out and i thought that it knocked me out because last night i was really tired and then i woke up with a headache but then i realized uh last night i was hanging out with listeners and I, I, I drank too much that's maybe what it was well i mean at some point you start confusing health and the effects of (laughs) of drinking substances right i mean but no it knocked me on my ass and Mm -hmm. you know i had to do that thing in the back of my head which was uh you know it's the old sports mentality you know you, you see those things over like locker rooms that say like pain is weakness leaving the body. Sure. And I was just like, sure. this is COVID getting its ass kicked right now. I oh, love right. it. Right, right. You have to tell yourself that story that, that, that your, uh, your RNA is, I don't know how it works. Anyway, uh, I'm very happy to have you. I'm very excited. Uh, whenever I get to talk to you, I've been listening to the muckrake. I think I'm all caught up. And you and Nick doing a great job covering all these issues on your podcast. And also your sub stack, which I really like dispatches from a collapsing state how often does it do, do you put out a new issue a new what do you call them newsletter yeah so i'm i'm doing at least one to two articles a week and then Article. if you're a subscriber i'm doing a, a question and answer mailbag uh i i, I 
put some pages from a ongoing novel that I'm working on. I showed people my notes from my new project. Oh, so cool. it's sort of a, a pulling back of the curtain, if you so will. So when you say you're working on a new book, uh, I heard you mention that on the podcast, your podcast, you're talking about a novel. No, uh, I'm kind of working on a new political book and I've got a novel going on on the side. Very nice. Yeah. Well, my, my therapist tells me that I enjoy safety and work. So you got you to lean into that. Makes sense. I mean, that, that, it's not the worst thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's better than other things. I would say that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I enjoy safety in, in my work and a lot of other things uh, that may or may not be work. So dispatches from a collapsing state. I wanted to mention, I wanted to ask you about a couple of uh, your, your recent articles, if we can, because there's, and then, there's just a shit ton to talk about uh, in general. Yeah. But before I do, I know that you covered this, think on your podcast maybe it was like the patreon episode or whatever but either way i wanted to ask you about the matt gates issue and the amount of the amount of attention that it's getting because i feel like it's getting too much attention but i also am open to the argument that it's getting the right amount of of attention from media it's obviously sensational so you understand why it's getting attention based on that but i felt like rachel maddow leading with it the other night and 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 others making such a big deal i'm not sure given everything else that's happened happening right now uh, I, how do you feel about the coverage well i mean let, let's be honest it's got all of the elements of tabloid media to it right it's got sex it's got extortion money uh, abuse uh clandestine conspiracies you know all all these things i mean it's yeah. it's yeah. It's catnip for political media. And one of the things I'm sure you've seen this on social media, uh, a lot of the insiders in journalism have heard rumors about this, which is one thing that always happens with D.C. insider beltway stories is they're always kicking around stories behind the stories, things yep. that haven't been confirmed, things that haven't come out. So one of the things that happens Matt Gaze is goes around on, on the uh, congressional floor show and nude pictures of women he's been with. Really? Yeah. But can we confirm that? No one's going to confirm that for you. But yeah, we've heard that. That kind of thing. Exactly. And, <laughs> until everybody who has been shown one of those pictures wants Gates out. Right. And there's so many different little parts of it that are happening here. Um, but, yeah, so eventually it comes to light. It's brought out and people just sort of jump on it. And by the way, it's it's getting a lot of attention because, quite frankly, it's showing, as always, that the right is completely full of hypocritical assholes. Right. It is one of those things that shows that there is a problem, an inherent problem. And by the way, while we're on the subject, let's also not point out that this is like real life QAnon shit. You know what I mean? Like this is like if we're going to sit here and we're going to talk about, oh, QAnon stories about child trafficking mm -hmm. and child abuse and all of that stuff. It's the exact same story with bizarre implications underneath it. Like this is the stuff that like makes the car go. It is the gas in the tank that makes the culture of spectacle go. So I would make the argument that if I was going to, you know, Pete, if I was your producer, if you're getting ready to go on the air, I would put this on your C to D block. OK, right. It would be something that we need to keep keep up on, but it wasn't the main issue in the country. It just seems hard this past week editorially. And I'm, you know, I'm not a, a journalist, but I've been in a lot of those rooms and certainly at cable news and, and, and say the Derek Chauvin case is happening. It's the trial of a century. It's, it, it's the reflection of America's soul, the outcome of it. And, and we're leading with Matt Gates. That seemed wrong to me. I, I'm not going to get too hung up on it. It's not the worst thing in the world. And as I love that you employ this phrase often, you can have two ideas in your head at once. I love when you say that. It's so important. But I, I just felt like given the other things happening, it was, as you said, for the C block. I would say first and foremost, the, the, the Chauvin trial, we are watching in, in, in real time, we're watching white supremacy and law enforcement, uh, mm -hmm. a police state that is on trial. And unfortunately, I think we know where this thing's going. You know what I mean? Like, I hope I that I'm wrong. I don't. You think Not he's going to get off? I, 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 I American culture tells me that, that that is more than likely. You know what I mean? If you flip a coin. Most of the black folks uh, I talk to think he will get off. And I said yeah, that, and, and I said to their faces last night, I was like, that's because you have to. You have to prepare yourself that he will, because the the idea of creating hope in this situation, it's just too far to fall. And they they agree there's some of that there. And I think you probably think that way as well. Well, there is. And, and I want to point out there's a couple of things that are happening here. So, like with the Chauvin trial, like, I mean, this thing 
could not have been more obvious what happened here. You right. know what I mean? The right. cruelty of it, the mm-hmm. the murder of it. And I think you're right. I think this should be this along with the exploitation of American people in this unequal society should be in the A block of every show from now into perpetuity. But I also want to point out really, really quickly, and this is something you're not hearing about everywhere, but you need to be this Gates story. It's not even about what's actually going on with Gates. Hmm. Like, if you listen to the stories about the extortion plot, it, like, like there's no way to listen to that without hearing that he was either being extorted by intelligence officers or intelligence officers off the clock. I mean, there there are so many facets to this story that literally nobody is talking about, and it shows how American media operates. There's actually proof that I thought he made all that up. There's proof that someone was there was an extortion. Okay, so again, we got to have a couple of things happening at once, mm-hmm. right? We so first and foremost, I haven't followed that closely. I just thought. I, oh, I haven't followed that closely. It's bad shit. If you huh. actually start like drilling down into the heart but of this really thing. there really is. Go ahead. You were going to explain. Okay. So on one hand, Gates has been using this extortion plot to completely keep people from, you know, really drilling down and understanding what's happening right. with the right. child trafficking right. issue. Right. So what he has been accused of allegedly Right. Is really, really awful. And the evidence is mounting on it. So in order to talk about the extortion plot, we have to be very careful that we do not take the lens off of this awful crime that has been committed. But it also seems like there probably was an extortion plot or attempted extortion. And the people at the heart of it, Pete, are intelligence officers. These are people who are ingrained. Oh, yeah. Who are ingrained in the American intelligence enterprise. Uh, We have one guy who is uh, either, depending upon the story, and this is always a tell, he's either in Air Force intelligence or naval intelligence, which, you know, when you kind of move around on those slots, like that just says central intelligence, right? Mm. We have another guy who's a formal, uh, former federal prosecutor who has been implicated in this whole thing. They were asking the Gates family for, I believe, 25 million. And they were using the cover story that they were going to use that money to go into Iran and rescue a captured CIA agent who is believed to have been to be dead. So what you actually have going on here in the great American tradition, and this has happened over and over and over again, you either have you either have functions of American government that are trying to get off the books slush fund money right. to carry out an operation, or you have U.S. intelligence operators who are freelancing on their own time but, to create their own slush fund. But that whole story falls apart when you know that Levinson is dead. Maybe he's dead and maybe he's not. That's the other fork in the road here. Mm -hmm. People believe he is dead. It might also be a complete front that would make the Gates family feel like they were paying this ransom money for something that was worth paying for. Wow. So this is a really, really so weird there is, story. But there is evidence of of extortion. I mean, you I, I you mentioned the people that are uh, apparently implicated that are current active uh, government and intel people. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. And, and, and here's the damnedest thing about They're it. They're going to be in a lot of trouble. Well, and so here's the thing, man. It's like this stuff isn't even like bobbing up on the surface right now. And it appears that Matt Gates in an attempt to distract from his own situation. And this is either him not giving a shit because he implicated Tucker Carlson yeah, on live Fox awesome. News the other night, which was amazing. He's either desperate or too stupid to understand that there was some sort of an intelligence situation that he is probably bringing to light at the moment. So this whole thing is like weird and it's being covered in exactly the wrong way than it should be covered at this point. How should it be covered from the standpoint of the extortion angle? I mean, what do you, what do you how would you? It needs, to, it needs to be both. There is apparently a conspiracy that Gates was a part of uh it seems like it originated in florida right it sounds like there was a child trafficking ring in florida that gates was a part of uh that is one thing that isn't being talked about right because it's it's almost like i would compare it to the spectacle coverage of mass shootings right Mm -hmm. so you have a mass shooting and suddenly everyone's like oh my god this lone nut went in if only we could do this or do that we Mm -hmm. would stop the lone nuts but then all of a sudden, we're not talking about all of the factors that lead to violence, mass shooting, why we're not actually going in and taking care of guns. We're missing 15 different important facets of it for the ready for primetime story, 
Right. So if we were going to have a conversation about either child trafficking, which, by the way, is something that actually does happen with the wealthy and powerful. Right. It's, sure. it's actually I mean, listen, just because you're paranoid about child trafficking and the QAnon circles doesn't mean child trafficking doesn't exist. Right. The other part, when we're talking about the intelligence operations, all of a sudden, Pete, you got to start talking about things like Iran Contra. You got to start talking yeah. about whether or not the United States government trafficked drugs for Cold War operations. You have to start talking about whether or not narco like kingpins were put up in place in place by the CIA. All of this stuff is on the record, but it's really uncomfortable to reckon with. I'm, it's really hard I'm, to wrestle with. I'm always less concerned though still very concerned with conspiracies that are that that have a a, a few people involved as often an extortion conspiracy does because it's not uh or obviously a freelance operation like iran contra or potentially this one uh, that is green lit in this case by the highest levels i don't think that that's the case here by either trump or obviously the biden administration that that it didn't come from that but it's not like this doesn't seem like the systemic issue that getting back to the a story and the more important story in my mind the chauvin trial is and so i want to ask you about that and make sure i get you know can i say one thing before we move to that do anything you want I will say that there is a connection between the Chauvin trial and this situation, (laughs) and that is the unequal pursuit of justice. Ah. Here's the question. Is there a situation in this country? And by the way, like you and I probably know that this is true without even having to scratch too far underneath the surface. The Gates family, who are millionaires and influential white people, right? The Matt Gates family, not the Bill Gates. Right. Well, well, I mean, you know, so like the Gates family were approached by people who had a leak from the Justice Department. This was not public knowledge. Right. This came from the Justice Department that he was being investigated for these crimes. Are a lot of really rich, wealthy white families being extorted and they're paying money in ransom and not being held accountable for investigations and crimes? Probably. That probably is happening in this country. Meanwhile, we have a guy who got caught with like allegedly a counterfeit bill, right? Who ends up dying in the street as people say, this is why you don't do drugs, kids. As the person who kills him does it. There is an unequal system of justice in this country that people don't really want to deal with. And I think that's what this Chauvin trial should be about and how it should be covered. It is being televised uh, every day. I feel like that's a good thing, right? Because we should always have cameras in the courtroom. There are downsides to that, but we like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and that's one of the things is like this shit has been going on for generations. I mean, people have been killed like this left and right. You know, I mean, can you even imagine like you could not have had uh, a, a rash of lynchings in a society where people had phones that could automatically show what was going on and show the humanity of it. That's what's happening here is it is a sea change of communication. Obviously, we had photographs. Obviously, we had coverage of this stuff. But now that we're in the moment and we're seeing systemic prejudice and we're seeing systemic racism i mean it, it's a really important development and and it might actually change things but this i, I want to believe by the way i want to believe that he'll be held accountable i want to believe that that will happen and that we're trending towards justice but i'm, I'm waiting to see what occurs so i want to ask you about your i think most recent issue article uh, dispatches from a collapsing state is jared h sex and substack you should go subscribe now because it's always really well written researched and uh, I, I always love in talking to you there's a, a historical uh, perspective which is so important and this issue is uh, no exception because you say uh, that the sea change is undeniable president joe biden's rollout of ambitious projects centered on a refashioning Uh, industry toward clean energy and working to relieve those suffering from economic crisis is a drastic departure from recent trends. And you go on, but then you say, uh, you you know, talking about how good this could be and how bad it was. But then you say, if we are to avoid those disasters and somehow right this ship, we must first understand how it is that we arrived at this bizarre moment. And then you then you really get me from that point on giving us the pathway to how we arrived. We're such reactionaries because of media, because of our lives, the, the, the yesterday story. But you're always good at both commenting on that and bringing back to perspective here. So where do you want to start and how how we got here? Because I know you can go way, way back or you could just go back to Reagan. 
Oh, yeah, I mean, that that's funny, right? Is that Reagan is always that sort of, um, for anybody who's ever played video games, he's sort of that save point. You know what I mean? Where it's like, you don't have to go back to the very beginning. You can just go back for to sure. Reaganism, which took, like, you don't have to play the entire game over. You can just see where things were put. And before that, high- FDR, because FDR, like, builds government and Reagan takes it apart. How's that? I just came up with it, you know, for that, for a save point. You can start wherever you want, but. No, and, and, and that is, that's a really important thing that we have to point out, which is, so right before we get into FDR, we have this idea, um, particularly because corporations owned the mechanisms of politics for forever. And as a matter of fact, you know what? Let's go one step further. Let's go back to the, uh, the civil war and let's, let's end the civil war and then let's move into post civil war reconstruction. As all of a sudden we're putting in railroad lines, we're Mm -hmm. putting in telegraph wires, right? All of a sudden you have a lot of people who are making a ton of money off of new technology and new infrastructure. You have the rise of robber barons who, by the way, are the precursors to your Zuckerbergs, your Dorsey's, your Bezos, all of these people who are able, Able to usher a society into a new era, right? And gain so much money that like, I'm, I'm sorry, but if Carnegie was living in the time of rockets, he would be trying to blast off to Mars, right? And so we actually have this period of time. Though I wish you would always pick the bankers because the, the bankers built nothing. At least the, the people oh. you just mentioned, the tech people built something that we use and, 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 and benefit from as opposed to Jamie Dimon and his friends. I mean, like that sounded bad but still you know the banksters as you as you will well and one of the things actually if you start going through history like one of the things you keep finding is you have all these crashes and it's really amazing that there's like this one point where all of a sudden it's like oh the economy crashed who who does the government go see the president goes and meets with jp morgan and it's like jp morgan please save us yeah and that's really when you start thinking about the idea that like one of the most powerful countries on the face of the earth is suddenly going out hat in hand to like one individual to save them. You understand something's wrong, right? So we have this period of time in America where these robber barons basically buy off government into to- in totality and people come to believe that there's no way to rein them in. There's no way for the government to do anything for the good of the people. And then I know this is shocking. The economy falls apart. Right. Because it doesn't work. It does. Capitalism always runs itself to the point where it can't work anymore. It can't grow anymore. It becomes so overheated that it collapses. Well, eventually you have FDR comes in who changes everything about the economy and says the government should have a say in how the economy works and the government should work to make people uh, have better lives. Right. There is a role for the economy or for the government in the economy. So, of course, we have FDR. We have the New Deal. And that is the consensus of the time until the 1970s, where we start having uh, stagflation. We start having all these issues with the economy. Reagan comes in and under the guise of bald eagles, you know, riding a rocket into the sky in red, white and blue, you know, sequence suits under that guise, which was complete and utter bullshit. It was a salesman job. And Reagan had no idea what he was doing. No, but he's a perfect guy to sell it because you just, you know, you you described, I mean, he's this white guy with his great hair, an actor's face, an actor, a performer. He knew he's a salesman is what he was. Absolutely he was. And if you actually think we we did an audio documentary on the Muckrake podcast about this, the election between Carter and Reagan, Carter came out and was like, I've got bad news. We need to look in the mirror and change ourselves. And Reagan's like, we don't need change. Nothing. We need to. We need to. We are great. What are you talking about? It's morning in America. And, And I have to tell you, it's. That's a that's a great salesman job compared to the other. Alternative. Yeah, I didn't see that that not. I don't know if there was more than one speech, but uh, President Carter, Jimmy Carter, while and you know, give an Oval Office speech saying we've got to we've got to do better. We got to look inward. We got to. Uh, work together. I mean, uh, what was it called? The malaise? Well, it's come to be called the malaise speech. And here's one of the it's funniest a great things speech. About- it's one of the, I it's feel like it's one of the speech. greatest speeches ever given by an American president. No one so, told me until a couple of years ago. So we did a complete audio documentary on this. If people want to look it up, it's called uh, a certain route to failure. And, and basically Carter comes out and he's like, listen, I'm going to talk to you about our problems and I'm going to be an adult about it. And and here are the problems. And meanwhile, he's like, there are people in this country who are going to tell you that it's not about that. We're great. We don't need to change anything. And they're going to lead us into destruction. And the amazing thing is it has since been known as the worst 
presidential speech of all time. He his approval rating went up by double digits after this speech. Like people dug it. But then old Ronald Wilson Reagan shows up and he's just like, these people are wrong. These people are pessimistic. So Reagan comes in as president. He hands over the keys to a bunch of think tanks and a bunch of hyper capitalists and they completely eradicate the New Deal. Now, it's an important thing to take a quick step back in time. The New Deal had already had the foundation sought out from underneath it because of the Red Scare. And one of the things that we don't talk about, we think mm-hmm. that suddenly Americans woke up one day in the 1950s and were like, oh, my God, communist. Well, that's not what happened. The wealthy and the powerful used fear of communism to undermine the New Deal coalition. And so what you're actually seeing with McCarthyism is they're going in and they're saying for all these FDRites, the people who are left over from the New Deal administration, they're going in, they're saying, oh, these people are secret communist. These people are uh, they're gay. They're uh, you know, they have drug problems. They do whatever. And they start rooting on the New Deal and it weakens it until we get to Reagan and which they absolutely destroyed it. And our government has been replaced with pro capitalistic, pro corporation forces that have no interest in actually providing anything for anybody. It's all about making sure that there are tax cuts, deregulation and continued redistribution of wealth from the bottom up. And the religious uh, white nationalist movement. Yeah. Who, by the way, they don't even like get along. Like Reagan wasn't even actually like really a Christian. Reagan was into a cult shit, which is something that we just don't talk about. We don't talk about the fact that everything that Reagan did had to be first cleared by an astrologer. Right. And that like there was like this weird connection and he wasn't particularly Christian. He was into weird occult messages about Atlantis and secret societies and all this stuff. But you know what? They made for great bedfellows and great teammates, and they worked together and they created a reactionary right that we're still having to deal with to this day. Well, to, to tie it all together, have you seen, I should have asked you this before I hit record, but have you seen the reporting on John Boehner's, the excerpt from John Boehner's new book? Fantastic. You have fantastic. You seen it all? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you say fantastic because a lot of people are reacting with, fuck you, John Boehner, for calling out all these people because you were part of this. You didn't. I don't care about any of that. I don't care about any of his hypocrisy. All I care about is that John Boehner is saying what he is saying. Forget about him. That the fact that he was the former speaker of the House Republican and is saying what he says about Roger Ailes and the new Republicans, the Tea Party, the birthers, all of that. Why do you say fantastic? What what are your what are your thoughts? I'm just about? glad it's getting out there. Because no, that's I, what listen, leads I think, us to I think John Boehner, I think John Boehner was an incredibly problematic politician. And 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 I want to say this. This is really important in this current environment, particularly in the post-Trump social media era. Mm. What we do is we have we have heroes and villains. And if somebody is on our side, like, by the way, it's like Comey. Remember that? Like Comey came out and basically put his finger on the scale of the 2016 election. And he was the biggest goat of all time. He comes after Trump and all of a sudden he's a hero. People are making memes of him. You know, we have to get out of that mentality. Uh, Boehner was an incredibly uh, problematic politician. But the fact that he is exposing the rot among the Republican right and what happened, because what actually he is exposing is an important thing we have to understand, which is their media was selling propaganda to the people that the politicians didn't believe. And then eventually the people elected politicians who believe the propaganda and they ended up circling, circling, circling. And what ends up happening, uh, to borrow a phrase from uh, from the past, they got high off their own supply. They started believing the bullshit that they were selling. And as they believed it, they got more and more paranoid. And nobody exemplifies that more than Roger Ailes. And John Boehner's accounts of how Roger Ailes went from a propagandist to an absolute paranoid maniac is exactly an an encapsulation of what happened. While assaulting women the entire time at Fox News. Like, (laughs) just there's so much so many parallels and common characteristics with these men. They're not, they're such, I tweeted this the other night and of course I suck at Twitter and I met Gates and an auto corrected me and I threw it out there that so many, I said something like so many Republican men are such terrible people, Trump and Jim Jordan and uh, who else did I write? But I, I went to write Mike Gates, Matt Gates and it came out Gretzky. 
fuck my life. I tweeted out Gretzky was a horrible person. I was attacked by all, everyone in Canada. I apologized to Gretzky and copied him in hopes that he would give me a retweet. But the point I'm surprised I'm surprised you didn't put NAFTA two in jeopardy. That, that feels <laughs> that feels like that, that was, was, uh, that, was that, that might have been an international incident. I'm not big enough on Twitter. If you had done it. But the the point I'm trying to make is these guys are really they're not just corrupt politicians. They're doing shitty, horrible sexual assault and and worse. I mean, from Denny Hastert, Hastert, the former speaker with kids to Matt Gates and Jim Jordan with the wrestlers and all of those allegations. And obviously they elected Donald Trump. They exactly what you just said. They started they got high off their own source. The, the, I mean, they're no longer John Boehner understood how government worked. He's like, you got their trade offs. You got to make compromise. We got to get shit done. These- well, and this is a really important thing. And again, this unfortunately is something that we don't actually talk about. We're just like, oh, those Republicans and, and, and oh, the Democrats are over here. We don't actually like look at the, the nature of this stuff. The Republican Party as it is, is a movement that has psychosexual problems. They hate themselves. They project their own self-hatred. I'm sorry, but Matt Gates was coming out talking about child trafficking and lending his support to things like QAnon. You have people like Jim Jordan who are talking about the people are coming after your kids. Well, who knows better than Jim Jordan? You know what I mean? Like what it is, is it's people who are projecting their own hangups and their own issues. They are unwell. And the more that they are unwell. And by the way, I, I haven't even brought up Trump in this situation. Trump worked as an avatar and a leader of this movement because he is the epitome of the person who has no actual idea of who they are. They are projecting an idea of themselves that isn't real, right? Donald Trump is tough. Really? He's a pampered, weak scion from a wealthy family who the moment that anybody laid a glove on him, he cried until you you, you fell asleep holding his pillow. (laughs) Like, this is a problem is that we don't actually look at what this thing is all about it's not just political it's societal it's personal yeah. it's psychological yeah. there's so much sexual it all you know every time one of these guys these are always the greatest whether it be like a catholic priest or a man of the cloth of some sort of preacher or a republican politician preaching against you know equality and then yeah. sucking a thousand dicks is the great it's so great when because it, it's it's horrible but it's so transparent to the psychology of what is happening. I think that's what you're talking about. This kind of hypocrisy. It's their own stuff that they are preaching against. And in fact, passing policy against their own identity coming through an actual legislation, not just rhetoric. Well, what we have in this country and and not to get too deep in the weeds, uh, I don't think this is why you had me on here, but that it's true is that America is in a really bad mental health crisis. And we have had a country that hasn't given people health care, that we haven't prioritized mental health care. On top of that, the entire American ethos is, hey, there's nothing wrong with you a purchase can't fix. You're one purchase away from being the perfect you. If you just got the right toothbrush, if you just got the right hair care, if you just bought the right car. Oh, by the way, we have a new truck over here. Are you feeling pretty bad about yourself and your manhood? Oh, don't worry. Our trucks are so large now that we have to. I don't know if you've seen this. This is amazing. They, GMC now has a truck that is so large. And by the way, it's being bought by a bunch of guys who either their bodies are falling apart or they can't necessarily get on their bulldozer sized trucks. That There's this new tailgate that has a step on it. And they're doing this because the trucks are so large and all of the commercials. This is fantastic. I, 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 every time it's on, I that lose my it. mind over this. We live in a country that we get told you could never, ever change anything. And the way the GMC advertises this step on a tailgate is it's a revolution, Pete. It's going to change the world. Now you can get done at your nine to five managerial job that you're getting salary for. And you can feel like you're a big, strong construction worker as you step up on the back of your truck in your khakis. We have a problem in this country. Oh, and the, problem, and the, you know, the problem is it's a mental health problem. Yeah, we, we yeah. have a massive issue yeah. in this country where people do not understand themselves and are projecting through their purchases and their politics. We should do a commercial like a comedy, a parody of all of the toxic masculinity where it's either a flamboyantly gay man selling that truck or a butch lesbian selling that truck. But either way, there are 
everybody could use a pickup truck if it weren't, you know, a, a considered a huge salute, uh, you know, pollution. I mean, these new electric pick, I want a pickup truck very badly. I won't buy one, but I want one. But the point is they're not just for a certain type of man, but that's how it's marketed. That's the mental illness that, you know, leads to, and you wrote a whole book about this, um, you know, and we can talk about the shootings and everything, but I got, I want to ask you before I let you go, um, cause I'm already over my time and you've been doing really, really good work talking comprehensively about immigration and, and the coverage of what's happening at the border. I love what you and Nick have been talking about on the podcast. You've been writing about this, but I want to just tie it all back together. The one point you didn't make, and I want you and everybody to, to, to make this point, maybe you made it and I missed it, but I, I hadn't heard it. Going back to John Boehner, the, the United States Senate, as divided as it was under Obama, passed comprehensive immigration reform with, I always get it wrong, eight to 12 Republican senators, had billions for border security, all the things that the Republicans want. It was comprehensive. It's so many. Actually, different- Pete, let me check my notes here. Who was the president who spearheaded amnesty? Oh, of, Ronald Wilson of course, Reagan. But that doesn't sound right. Yeah, but that was hmm. diff- That was at a different time with right wing media and a different president. Right. Like he was able to right. do that. And, and yet still people rejected it. Like I think Pat Buchanan at the time. But but the point is, this is a huge deal. It's being covered yeah. wrong. I and mean, let's be clear. There was a, a so, not a perfect solution, but in 2013, a huge comp- and John Boehner was Speaker of the House. And Jared, the story goes that he did not put it up for a vote which is his job, his responsibility, because it would have passed. It would have passed. Yep. Yeah. And what you actually see with the Republican Party, they made a, a very distinct choice. They actually believed in immigration reform. And and this is important. I wrote about this over on uh, uh, the dispatches thing. Like the Republican Party doesn't want to close the border. That's where they get their labor. They don't actually think that Mexicans are dangerous. They think that like they can get a bunch of votes and fundraise. No, all off their of special it. interests are for immigration reform. The Chamber of Commerce, they're all for it. It's cheap labor. You're absolutely right. A hundred percent. And so when we have this discussion, and, and and I hate it, man. I hate turning on the TV and having to watch these hacks. We're like, what about this crisis at the border? Mm-hmm. And it's like, there's no actual crisis at the border. The problem is that the United States of America has destabilized one country after another and has leveraged every trade deal on their behalf in order to exploit these people. There's a reason why free trade has happened. It's so that the wealthy and the powerful can go ahead and have have people make their things for less than a minimum wage and not give them any sort of benefits and then ship it to America for, you know, lesser cost. This entire situation is a larger scale thing than, oh, my God, Pete, yeah. did you know there's a yeah. caravan hanging ha- heading for the border right you now? Just, like, what will happen when they get here? I'm not good at metaphors, but the way you're describing it just made me think of you have a milkshake. And uh, you drink it. It's all gone. And Mm -hmm. then everybody else uh, guy fucked up the metaphor. The point is, we sucked every resource out of Honduras. We sucked it all out. We took all their stuff. Their their land is barely arable in certain places in Central America because of climate, because of these trade deals you're talking about. So now there's no more milkshake for them to drink. We took their We drank all of their milkshake. So they're coming to America to get some of it back. They need something. That was where I was. Trying to and by to the it. way, it, the, the even more frightening part about it is all of these countries, we have not just like taken the resources in order to take those resources and in order to make sure that we maintain American hegemony, we have destabilized their their political institutions. We've actually created situations where not only do they want a milkshake, they don't want to get shot. And there's somebody pointing a gun and they have a choice between getting shot or coming over and trying to get a milkshake. And it's not a hard choice for them. And they have to go through these arduous opportunities. They have to be exploited. They have to be dehumanized. They possibly have to lose their lives and be exploited. And instead, we're sitting here. We're like, what are we going to do about this situation? Well, we're not going to handle the situation unless we understand the situation. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, when when Donald Trump said uh, referred to certain countries as shithole countries, it was probably one of the worst things he ever said. But in a way, it's it's true that there are a lot of countries that are economic situations are terrible. And I just don't like when when, you know, as I hear this with a lot of kind of politically correct minded liberals on the immigration issue. They don't want to leave their country. They don't want to. leave. Yeah, they do. Their country sucks for a lot of reasons. And a lot of that is what you're saying, because we had a lot to do with it. I mean, I remember reading John Perkins. I don't know how much of that shit is right, but uh, confessions of an economic hitman. All this stuff in Central America, all these things that have happened that we, we yeah, I think uh, it was Hillary Clinton that stood by that this now corrupt. Is it still that guy? Honduran president. I mean, it's 
they do want to leave their countries. They do want to come to America or somewhere else because their countries in many ways are dangerous and there's not opportunity. So stop saying they don't want to leave them for certain reasons. They don't culturally and, you know, whatever. But for a lot, it, sometimes people want to leave. Yeah. And let's stop pretending that this debate doesn't have incredible hints of white supremacy at the heart of it. And and by the way, economic supremacy. You want to go back to Reagan. One of the worst things that Reagan actually did is as a salesman, he convinced Americans that people who are poor and in need they're in poor, they're poor and they're in need because they have failed somehow. Right. When we look <laughs> yeah. at the people coming to yeah. our border, we're like, Oh my God, they're probably diseased. They're probably yeah. criminals. I assume some of them are good people, but the problem is we have created this entire white supremacist economic supremacist system that has permeated even the thoughts and the arguments of people who believe that they're liberals, people who believe that they're on the left. It is a problem that they haven't even come to reckon with, which is, is that we have a problematic situation that we don't even talk about because if we were to actually talk about it, Pete, we would we would we'd have to take a long look in the mirror. And as Jimmy Carter can tell you from his one term in the presidency, we do not like to look in that mirror. And I'm going to play some of that speech as soon as we don't, are done here. But if you have two more minutes, I do want to ask you about your in your recent issue also uh, talking about the corporate philosophy, the PR, the unrestrained greed and how that intersects with or how that comes up right now and what's going on in the Georgia from Delta and Coca-Cola and other companies. And as you so rightly put in this piece, they, they're going to do whatever's best to sell Coca-Cola. Yeah. I mean, that's all. It's yeah. about. And, and, and real fast, just, uh, you know, not to not to overburden people with history, but it's like I'm working on this new book. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know what I discovered? Corporations were created in order to enslave people and carry out colonization. They were created specifically to be an exploitive machine. They have one purpose. Every corporation has one purpose, and that is profit and growth that leads to more profit. So, Everything that, yeah. You're talking about the difference between, just so we're clear, so we're not just demonizing business people. You're talking about the legal idea of to be incorporated in the corporate American style corporation, different than yes. the guy in 1700 who, who was a blacksmith and did horseshoes. You're not talking about the business owner, the saloon owner. You're talking about when it changed to create a uh, uh, an economic a paradigm that they could do the things you're saying and exploit well, everything. And, and so in the 1500s and the 1600s, it was basically a new arm of the state. The state created corporations that had private individuals who would carry out the slave trade or go into other countries and oppress civilizations and actually destroy civilizations. They would come in and basically, you know, yeah. mess up families and mess up institutions and cultures. What eventually happened is that corporation turned into a body that has a legal responsibility for nothing besides profit. And this is a thing that's hard to wrap around because we unfortunately live in a society where we want to believe that there are good businesses out there and there are businesses that are better than other businesses. Let's be very clear. Right. But there's always a little bit of blood on the ledger. And it's important to point out that like when you go to like a Coca-Cola or a Delta and like their mission statement, like page, right. And it's like, we believe in inclusivity, diversity, human dignity, all this stuff. That's not what they actually believe. They know that they have to say they believe that or else they'll be boycotted or else hmm. there will be um, because we make decisions politically with our money at this point. I mean, there's a reason why Nike, who, again, has exploited amazing swaths of people around the world and has engaged in exploitation in so many different ways, has hurt the environment um, that they went out and they got, uh, you know, Kaepernick for millions of dollars so they could say, hey, look, we support these things, right? Exactly. right? Yeah. So what happens is these corporations understand that there has to be a performative progressiveness in what they do or else they will suffer economic consequences. Coca-Cola doesn't care about this shit. Delta doesn't care about this shit. What they care about is not getting boycotted and not getting dragged on social media. And you'll notice it didn't happen until there was outrage. It didn't happen until people started saying, hey, Delta, where are you at on this? Coca-Cola, where are you at on this? By the way, there's a chance of boycott on all of this. And suddenly they're like, this is egregious and it will not stand. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, 
And that's simply the nature of the corporation. And we have a problem, particularly on the left, where people are like, oh, if somebody says the right thing, they must be on our side. They must be a hero. They must be on the right side of history. That's not true. Performative progressivism is a real issue in this country and it messes up our politics and it completely skews. Reality. Uh, let's talk about that next time. Performative uh, progressivism, the idea that you, you know, a PR tested focus group tested PR message uh, is, you know, put out there to make people feel good. A certain type of people for sure. Cause everybody buys sneakers, not just Democrats. Republicans. Most, uh, yeah. Republicans buy <laughs> yeah, sneakers. I, too. Jordan said, I, I Republicans, Republicans buy, buy sneakers, sneakers too. too. Yeah. Jared, oh man, always great talking to you. I always learn a lot and uh, just try to hang. Thank you so much for joining me as always, pal. Thanks, buddy. All right, Jared Yates, Sexton, everybody. Subscribe to his Substack newsletter. Listen to his podcast. Buy his book. Follow him on Twitter at JY Sexton. Tell him you heard him here on the show. Support this podcast with a paid subscription. And you could just go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic for that or click on the paid subscription link in the show notes. Welcome to all the new subscribers. And I will be back with the regular format tomorrow. I'm actually not going to play the Jimmy Carter speech. It is good. I think it's interesting, but uh, it's a little stale at this point. Go back and watch it. Just uh, search Malay's speech or crisis of confidence speech. That's all I've got for you because I am spent, but I will be back and ready and fired up for tomorrow's show. Thanks for listening, folks. John Carroll, take us out. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eyes. We got to let him know it's his turn to go. See it clear and all you hear is a lie. Don't get up off of your butt. Get down off of your fence. Even if it ain't a very friendly audience. Well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense. And you stand. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. Experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up, stand oh, up, got to stand up, oh, come on, just stand up. Everybody got to stand up in the darkest hour. Stand up, people got the power. Stand up. And that is it, folks. And thank you very much for listening all the way to the end. I just want to say I hope that you get away with your family or friends or loved ones soon. I I can't describe how good it was for my family to get out of here and stay in a hotel and just be together. 
in that way, even though we've been on top of each other for a long time, just to get away and be together, it really was great. I measure the great times by how much laughter there was, and there was a lot of laughter in the last 24 hours with my family, so I'm feeling good. Talk to you tomorrow.